Well, cowabunga dudes and dudettes, it's me, your host, Stefan Satani from a Comedy Advice Podcast, and I'm here about to dish you up some deep dish intro of this hearty podcast with tons of toppings. We've got half humor, half wisdom. I hope you guys like it. Please don't return it because we don't take back stale pods okay the delivery guy aka me worked real hard so i hope i get your tip deep inside my soul but you know what guys we've got chris gethard today maybe you guys have seen him on the office maybe you've seen him on parks and rec the other guys or uh his amazing special on hbo career suicide or his brand new special half my life on amazon prime or vimeo for all you international folks Oh, Chris Gethard is an absolute treat. And we just walk through the winding valleys of his life. He gives some really good pearls of wisdom. And I hope you guys get some insights from it too. Get a little wiser, maybe a little wealthier. Invest in a stock. We don't give any stock advice, but if we make you feel like you should, and you should do it, I'm not responsible for any losses or gains because I am not a financial advisor. I'm smart enough to put that disclaimer in here. And, you know, support Chris, watch his special, follow him, see him in town. If he is in your town, go to chrisgathard.com for tickets. It's all in the show notes. And while you're at it, show me some love. I know you've been here before. Just go on over and subscribe, leave a review and follow me on Instagram for lots of love. Subscribe wherever you can, even on the old YouTube. I've got that channel just in its infant stages. I think it's learning to crawl now. And saying words bleep bloop 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 as i think maybe that's binary i'm not sure which language it's learning or who's teaching it these words algorithms but go on over there show me some love you guys are the most incredible creatures i have ever spoken to i, I can't hear you please scream louder if you're out of breath though from the screaming you can dm me or email me or maybe a candy gram i'm not gonna dilly dally anymore prepare to be dazzled here we go chris hello hello how are you i'm doing well how are you i'm good thanks so much for having me today oh thank you so much for letting me have you and uh i love the color coordination so i think it's a salmon up until a bright red it's beautiful thank you yeah i think long and hard about color coordination so. <laughs> As you can tell, I do not. It's like uh, <laughs> some stripes and then it's done. That's the deal. And then, uh, yeah, Indeed. an almost constructed wall of sound panels. So, And do you, do you need me to record on my end or is it all just through the Zoom? Oh, it's all just through the Zoom. Oh, yeah. nice. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I found it's very crisp audio as well. And uh, right. I have to say, I've been listening to a lot of Gethard and... I think you have one of the smoothest, silkiest voices out there. It's That's nice of you to say. I personally am not a fan of my voice. <laughs> not a fan. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that someone is. So thank you for that. Maybe I could have chosen some better adjectives for it that were a little less creepy, but uh, it, it's, no, it's a I, great voice. I appreciate the uh, <laughs> I appreciate the 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 words of support but people say that to me sometimes and i'm like oh really i've always hated my voice actually so i guess it's i guess it's encouraging or validating on some level oh man you know as i was listening to you i was thinking man you deserve a, a leading role in a pixar film of just Let's some make character that happen please <laughs> My, my two-year-old son would be so impressed and I could live off those residuals forever. So yeah, please, Pixar, if you're listening and somebody's sitting there right now hitting their head going, how have we never thought of that? Just understand <laughs> that I'm down. I'm ready to go. Awesome. We're sending that into the universe. And I think there are a couple of Pixar folks that listen. So maybe oh, we'll see. We're Let's sending it, it out. Happen. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm ready to rock and I'm a very hard worker. So um yeah, you can trust me, Pixar. Let's do it. And my kid Amazing. is obsessed with cars. If you could put me in something in the cars franchise, my son would be blown away. So let's let's go for it, Pixar. Oh man, move over Owen Wilson. Uh mm -hmm. make room for Chris Gethard. 100%. I 100 percent 
what car would you want to be if you could be one of the cars? Well, I could never even dream of being uh, Lightning McQueen, let alone Tom Mater, who I think is a comedic force. Um, but I'm happy to be one of those ancillary. Any any resident of Radiator Springs, I'd be happy to happy to step in and do my part. Even just like a little Prius. Uh, oh, uh, spreading the the necessity of electric vehicles moving forward. I'd love that. I think I'd make the sound. I, I feel like one of those uh, PHEVs, like a plug-in hybrid. I'd love to be a plug-in hybrid in the cars universe as we teach kids about emission standards. I think I'd oh be primed gosh. and ready for that. What better way to teach kids about greenhouse gases than a little Prius named uh, Pete. Pete the Prius. Yeah. There you go. Let's make it happen. Oh, I love it. Let's well, make it happen. Let's make it happen. And we can continue making the case on this wonderful podcast, a comedy advice podcast with your host, Stefan Satani. Joining me today, if you guys have not heard this wonderful voice or have seen this wonderful face with beautiful matching colors, he's an actor, he's a comedian, he's toured internationally. He's also performed not just for people, but for alligators. Uh, he's an mm -hmm. author with multiple books. Everybody, please welcome Chris Gethard. Clap, 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 clap. Sorry, that was such a disappointing clap. I should have really made oh, no. it thunderous. I'll take what I can get at this point in my career. <laughs> well, I mean, what a career you've had. I just finished watching your new special, Half My Life, which is about you doing stand-up. It's kind of like a documentary style, um, doing some stand-up in some really cool punk rock places where yeah. you've also done stand-up for about half your life, which is really cool. Yeah, thanks uh, for checking it out. Oh, yes, amazing. And the link will be in the show notes for all you Americans that can see it on Amazon Prime International. It's going to be Vimeo, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but what a wonderful special it was. And it was super cool how it was that that non traditional style where it was, I think you went through nine different venues and you were doing your sets and uh, you also did some live um, Beautiful Anonymous, which is a wonderful podcast, by the way, that Thanks. we talk about in a sec. But uh, what what ended up driving the force of you wanting to do a documentary style for your special? Well, there's a few things in there. Like, first and foremost is is um, kind of creatively, you got like the creative side of it, and then maybe some of the strategy side of it, which is like, creatively, mm -hmm. I was really interested in the idea of of a few things, which is one most specials and I've, you know, I, I did an HBO special and HBO specials are very much this. It's like you work on that material for years. And then when you record it, Hey, let's go rent a really nice venue. Let's put on some nice clothes, some fancy sneakers and let's do the thing and let's make it like a celebration of this material. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's really great. But I, I really, um, I really liked the idea of kind of showing what the 98% of the time that's not that is like that's like the tip of the iceberg where everything gets polished up and shown off to the world but i think even the highest level comedians you do a lot of shows for a few dozen people or in venues that are really off the grid and when you're trying to figure out if the material works or not um you're taking it to places where it's very low risk and and where there's not pressure on it and you don't have to please mm -hmm. legions of fans so um so I kind of wanted it to show what it's really like. Like, yeah, like the Asbury Park shows. When I watched back the footage, I was laughing because I'm like, yeah, like. Attention listeners across the galaxy, all the way from Australia to Houston. Do we have a pube problem? If so, our friends at Manscaped have cleared you for takeoff with their fourth generation and brand new lawnmower 4.0. Kick your pubes to the next planet with the performance package 4.0. The orbits in your pants will feel like you're in zero gravity when you use the best tools for the job from the leaders in male grooming. Join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get your rocket ready for takeoff by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code ACAP. You know, I've tried to trim my clackers with regular trimmers, scissors, heck, even just yanking them out. But you know what? Each time there's blood or tears or both. So guys, don't be a silly goose. Be a smart duck. Get the new Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. This spaceship is here to guide you on a journey to trim your body, balls, butt, and even Uranus. I'll tell you what, I got one and I used it and I went on several trips around the galaxy. Abort hairy balls and buzz Lightyear that Woody with Manscaped. 
Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code ACAP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code ACAP at manscaped.com. For a clean trinity and beyond, your space balls will thank you. I'm just kind of, I'm wearing like a blue sweatshirt and jeans. Like it's not even that nice. And <laughs> I have a little bit of a cold and you can hear it in my voice in the footage of the special. And there's a part of me that was like, oh, should I even put this out? Like I kind of look bad and sound bad. And I go, no, oh, that's what that crowd got that night. And that's like, that's what most shows are, right? You kind of just show up chilled out, mm-hmm. like in the outfit you're wearing and it's a low ceiling and you're making eye contact with those people. And there's an intimacy there that I wanted to capture. And Mm -hmm. that felt important to me. And then I was really happy because we have some footage throughout the special where things kind of go awry. Um, Mm -hmm. There's footage of a show in Baltimore, maybe my favorite part of the special where this girl gets on stage with me and starts wrestling me and things like that will happen sometimes at shows. And I really enjoy letting them happen. And Mm -hmm. that was another side of it, which was like, I think, you do a special like in a fancy venue in your fancy clothes, nobody's going to get on stage and wrestle you, but that sometimes things will happen at my shows. So I said, let me just film a bunch of shows and see if we get any moments like that. And I didn't like bait them or foment them, but they happen. And there's a few things in there. So I wanted to kind of do that creatively and then strategically. It's also, I think a lot about how just numbers wise, you got mm-hmm. Netflix that puts out so many specials a year now, and that's before mm-hmm. you even get to the prestige HBO stuff, whatever Comedy Central does that year. Amazon, Peacock just started putting out specials. Showtime puts out specials. Uh, and then all mm-hmm. the streaming platforms, I go, oh, there's just there's so many now. There's so many now. So I kind of feel like yeah. it's on me as an artist, for better or for worse. Sometimes I've self-sabotaged in my career. I go, let me make something that just looks different, feels different so that people know this is not this is not just another version of the same stuff you're seeing hundreds of other times this year it's not just some person on a stage with a mic it's going to be a little different maybe a little more challenging maybe a little bit harder to lock into but also has a little bit more emotion to it and a little bit more unpredictability to it and Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah get to show off all those sides of it and and part of showing off the side real side of comedians isn't just like low ceilings and eye contact with with crowds it's also sitting in traffic and yeah. it's wondering why you're here at this show and you're not even selling out in richmond and you're kind of depressed and showing that pulling back the curtain on that side of it too so the doc style yeah. allowed us to do that sorry i rambled so much that was an easy question the answer was no. too long i apologize no no no, no. a power packed answer that was and it, <laughs> a lot to say about it too because it's really cool that you were able to show that side of the work that a comedian has to put in where I think a lot of people, and I I speak to a lot of people to this day where they're just like, Oh, I thought comedy was, they just go up there for their HBO special and they just chat and they make stuff up and that's how it goes. And um, it's so different. So I think this is a really nice dive into the probably freezing cold pool of the life of a comedian. And Mm -hmm. it was also cool to see, I know you were talking about in Asbury Park when you were doing those shows and you were a little sick. You also had that footage of, (laughs) I I don't know if it was because of that show, but you were like, yeah, I'm a little sick because my- my son um, coughed into son my mouth coughed yeah into my open mouth. that was for mo- many of the shows actually it was i think it was before our i think it was before the third show on the tour i think we did buffalo and detroit then i came home and we were about to do brooklyn and it was the mm-hmm. morning of the brooklyn show my infant son coughed directly into my mouth oh. and i knew oh i'm screwed i'm screwed and and you can kind of track my health throughout the rest of the <laughs> Oh man. And it, it, and then also the the young woman that had come with a friend, had not seen you before and decided yes. to wrestle you on stage was fascinating. And I, th- there was also a guy that was a referee and Oh there yeah. Was, there was a guy what? in the crowd that night who happened to be a wrestling coach, so he came he came on stage too to make sure everything stayed above board. Yes. Oh man. What a, and then I think if it was the first time in Buffalo, you had a 9 a.m. show. Yeah. They served pancakes that yeah. almost didn't get delivered. Yeah. It was, yeah. The hot, the space was pretty janky, their electrical system. That, and that was not staged as like a stunt or a thing for the doc. 
that was just kind of reflective of how I like to work with spaces where that was the space Sugar City in Buffalo. They're mm-hmm. DIY, mostly music space, like community center, all ages, DIY space, like very mm-hmm. off the grid, I think, for the comedy circuit. Um, mm-hmm. But a place where I've been lucky to be welcomed into that type of environment. And we had the the Friday night show sold out and they were like, stay and do another one on Saturday, man. We're getting a lot of people asking. And I had my show in Detroit Saturday night. And I said, I don't think I can. They said, what if we do a 9 a.m. pancake show? So that was their idea. And I was just huh. like, yep, because A, it's a challenge and it sounds interesting and funny. And B, uh-huh. for me, I'm like, I like working with spaces that are non-traditional comedy spaces. Like I, I really want to avoid the two drink minimum as much as I can moving forward mm-hmm. in my career and in general in my career. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, yeah, this is a place where if, if I could sell out a thing and that helps them get a little scratch in their pocket, helps me get a little scratch in my pocket. Why not? I'll do a 9 a.m. show if it helps the cool DIY art space. I don't know if I would do that for like the, uh, you know, a, a club in a mall that's charging $40 tickets plus two drinks. And I've done those spaces too. But the right. scrappy little spaces like the other weirdos, let's do it. Let's make it happen. And that show, I think, was actually pretty magical for the people who were there. Oh, that, I was going to ask about that, too, because obviously the footage that was showing the people were cracking up at the stories you were telling and, and the jokes you were telling. But I was thinking at first when you said, yeah, we're going to do a 9 a.m. show. I was yeah. like, oh, my gosh, Terrible comedy, idea. comedy in the light. Yeah, that's uh, it's yeah. different. It's different for sure. But do you think that it was too different or do you think, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I can make magic no matter what time of day it is it was definitely different i mean they even the way the tables you know the tables were kind of 90 degrees to the stage usually everyone faces the stage but the nature of this you realize people are eating which if you had half the people facing you half the people their backs would be towards you because there's pay so everything was kind of like at a at that like 90 degree like even the layout (laughs) of the space was strange people were Uh tired like I mean, legitimately, I was talking to people before the show who were going like, I'm looking forward to the show. Do you know if they have coffee? Where I'm like, oh, that's a challenge. People are literally, they're not caffeinated yet. This is going to be tough. But I like the challenge. I, I, I think a lot of my career, people who know me know, like I sometimes kind of like setting myself at a deficit. And I like doing the traditional stuff too, but why not? And And I think more and more the older I get and the process of making the special and editing it, I kind of realized there is certainly elements of a midlife crisis throughout of me going, I don't know why I still do this. And then in editing it, putting it all together, I go, because I get to give the audience a good time. Like the best shows are the ones where the audience walks away feeling like it's about them. It's not about me. Like I don't want to be one of the many comedians who kind of take it as far as I grab the mic, I get my laughs. Thank you for your money. Good night. Like I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't, I really am not, that doesn't give me an adrenaline rush. Um, mm-hmm. never really has, let alone at this stage. So I'm like, yeah, if I can give you a killer show and it's at 9 a.m., like I have a feeling there's going to be people who, people who are at that show because it's also Buffalo and I love Buffalo. I think Buffalo mm-hmm. is a great town, but it's not, this is not like one of the, this is not like a, I just feel like there's probably people who are going to go, he stepped up for us. He came out here to this town where maybe some people passed by this town. Maybe some people would go, this is just like a stop between New York. Why would I stop here? It's between New York and Chicago. Let me go make real money at both those places, you know, Mm -hmm. come to Buffalo where maybe some people feel passed over and not only come and try to do a killer show, but go, Hey, if you guys sold out that first one, I'm flattered enough by that. We'll do a second one. It's at 9 a.m. And I'm going to try to make it something really special. To me, that's a cool challenge. It's it's just kind of a cool way to try to be, try to give to your audience a little bit. So I look for stuff like that. I even just um, this past Saturday, a couple days ago, mm-hmm. did my first, uh, I, I'm touring again, 20 cities this year. And the first one was in a backyard in Binghamton. Again, like there's a lot of people who skip over Binghamton. There's a lot of people who wouldn't play some punk rockers backyard, but Mm -hmm. I've already been getting messages from people who are, who were there going like, Holy shit, man, that was cool that you were there. You were just like hanging out in the backyard. I'm like, yeah, I think there's something to be said for make it about your audience. Give them as much as you can give them. Try to make it not about you, make it about them. 
So that's really where my head's been at lately. That's really cool. And I think it's in the right place. And funny enough, I did note that as I was watching the special and seeing those shots where you were taking pictures with fans get it, and they were taking selfies with you. And it was so sweet. This one fan, she was kind of, she had her arm around you. And then she was just like, oh, and she went in for a big squeeze. And it, it just said so much to me of like, this is really cool. Not just what you're doing, but who you're doing it for, the places you're doing it in. And like you said, those places that some other comics might just skip over. I feel like they yeah. really appreciate what you're doing. And I, I kind of, I sort of feel like I've had some stretches in my life where things have gotten to a bigger level. And my instinct has always been keep it small, keep it intimate. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've always survived on a cult fan base. Like most mm -hmm. people don't know who I am, but then I have a, I have a, a solid group of people who I think really have a lot of love for what I've done. And those are the people who allow me to continue doing it. And I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, like I'm, I'm happy to hang out after the show. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I've had venues sometimes get a little irritated with me because I'll be selling merch and it'll take forever. Uh -huh. And I don't sell that much merch. It's because I'll have a 10 minute conversation with every person who, oh buy something and some of that at times it can be a little much but right. i'm just psyched anybody cares and if somebody wants to come and give me a hug i'm like that's amazing i need that too you know i need that too mm -hmm. so uh, i i i always i grew up um a huge nerd about comedy but when i was young there wasn't really access to it beyond clubs like the alternative scene didn't exist yet so for me a lot of it's music and I just remember that feeling of going to shows and seeing local bands. And even when bigger bands came through, you know, like having all their lyrics memorized and they'd see you sing along, you'd be making eye contact with the singer because the space was so small. Or you'd go and you'd buy mm -hmm. a t-shirt after the show and it would be the singer, or the drummer handed you the t-shirt and you handed them your money. And it was one-on-one -on -one and it was eye to eye. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot about the music scene I came up in and how much it gave me. And I do really, my instinct is always to try to loop it back around to those values when it comes to comedy. Dang, that is a moment of silence to just let that sink in. And, and I, was, I was thinking about that as well because I know that you had met your wife. Well, you guys got married. She was the one of the lead singers on your show, the Chris Gethard yes. show, but you guys, had kind of been fans before. I know she was part of the Unlovables. And yeah. You were a fan of that band, which was really cool. And um, and then she got snuck into your shows before she started playing there. Yes, yes. When the Chris <laughs> Gethard show was at UCB, uh, the band used to sneak her in. And I was very intimidated by her because she was highly unlovable in my mind. And uh -huh. there was one show, the Gethard show at UCB was really, really screwed up at times. It would really, we'd take things too far. <laughs> I wound up totally naked on stage hosting once and turned around and realized that the band had snuck her in and she was sitting behind the drum set. And I just, she says the first time we ever actually spoke to each other was I made eye contact with her while totally naked and just went, Oh no, you're here. And then continued hosting the show. And then later Talk we got about a meet cute. Oh, it was pretty wild. It was pretty wild, but yeah, I mean, I was, at, I was lucky that I, I was at UCB. I started there mm -hmm. in, summer 2000 and it was nothing very scrappy and small and now that it's wow. kind of imploded in new york i kind of feel okay about reminiscing about the old days I, it had become mm -hmm. a little more corporate it had definitely become kind of the big kid on the block in a way that i didn't love always by the end mm -hmm. people had some bad feelings towards it around new york sometimes but i think mm -hmm. back to those early days and i go oh there was there was there's a lot of crossover between the, the comedy, the UCB scene and the punk rock scene. And mm -hmm. there were actually a bunch of musicians and bands I knew who used to perform, you know, who became comedians, um, mm -hmm. who were doing shows and the punk rock scene used to show up and watch shows. So I felt very at home. I think that coming up as a punk rock kid in Jersey, that era UCB was an incredible find for me because I went, oh, I sort of understand how to exist in this space because it feels to me like the shows I used to go to mm -hmm. when I was watching punk bands. It, and it's because I think so many people had kind of come up through music. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's, Hallie was not the only punk rocker hanging out at ECV back then. 
that's but she's the only one I married and had a child with. So <laughs> cool. nice. I was gonna ask you because I was listening to your podcast, Beautiful Anonymous, where you talk with one person for one hour, you can't hang up. Um, they're totally anonymous, no holds barred. And you were chatting in this episode with a she was deemed as the marvelous Miss Maisel in real life. Oh, yes, yes, in uh, Canada, right? Yeah, yes, 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 she Excellent was cool. episode. Yeah, super Thanks. cool. And, um, and uh, I was gonna say, you talked about how little known fact about you, you played was it clarinet? And you, uh, I was gonna ask, do you play any other instruments? Cello, it was cello. cello. I'm sorry, cello. Oh, that's yeah, okay. Just, yeah, start with C. Yeah, I grew up playing cello from third grade. Up until about midway through high school, Dang. and uh, and then it was funny actually. I was touring uh, back in the day. Some friends and I were touring, and we crashed at uh, another comedian who I'm friends with. Who he's from uh -huh. Oregon, and we stayed at his parents' house. And his mom played cello, and I was like, I "said Okay, if I mess around with that," and I was able to still read the music and play. So. <laughs> Yeah, I just I, midlife crisis moment. I went and bought a cello. I've started. I've started dabbling with cello again at the age of forty-one, just to oh. see what I still got. <laughs> but I didn't play any other instruments. Um, I think if I, I think if I was better at music, I probably just would have gotten into a band. I probably would have become part of the. You know, I would have started playing in a punk band in the scene. But I started. It's funny. Mm -hmm. I look back and. I would go and see bands and my favorite bands when I look back on it were the ones who would always like goof around between songs and talk into like the bands with really good banter. And I wound uh -huh. up making a fanzine, which was, you know, back in the day you would make these like homemade magazines and mine was really funny. And I go, oh, okay. So I always wanted to be a comedian and I was floating around this other creative scene. If I, if I could have just played bass, I probably just would have been in a band and never, never even tried comedy. Oh man. That, that's super cool. And I, I was going to say one more thing about just your writing in terms of going back to comedy. I think, I think you might be one of the best writers in terms of comedians that I have seen. I, I oh, may not be you. a very good judge, but I, I was just going back to your most recent special, Half My Life. I loved not just the jokes and the sets and the bits, because I thought those were well written and beautifully written, actually, because... I feel a lot of comedians, they might stick to this structure of let's just get the most punchlines out in the least amount of time possible. And I think that's a very solid plan or way to go because you're keeping the audience laughing. I feel like you are definitely a master of that as well because the Gatorland bit, I thought you just kept people laughing like that i think there was also the apocalypse plan bit which was really cool um but then there were other bits where there was just a little bit of lingering people were just captivated and hanging on every word of the stories that you were telling and um you were able to keep them captivated and then drop a a sick punch uh, i don't know if i should have said it like that but but with the um the hipster truck the hipster dessert truck hitting an old man yeah. that was another example of just the great writing and then even outside of the sets where I'm, i don't want to spoil it but the Gatorland, how the bit turns into a story about telling that bit on a radio and then at the very end it was just a great way of fitting that all together and thank then just, you yeah absolutely and then even just going back to your your hbo special career suicide i thought that was Marvel marvelously written and in another testament of it's just people are hanging on every word of your story you've also got these little sprinkles of jersey in there because i know that you have your new podcast um new jersey is the world and so i live in arizona but i spent eight years in jersey i spent two years living in montclair and oh, then right my next, wife, I, I lived in montclair for a while I, I heard on the special, I know you grew up in West Orange. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. off of, um, I was right off of Alexander, um, really close to, close to Valley. God, I'm forgetting all the streets I was, now. I was off of uh, Grove, right near the library. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So when you were talking about Valley Road, I just, I, I felt like as a person that has experienced jersey the uh, mm -hmm. montclair was beautiful i spent another five years in elizabeth new jersey which was tough town 
yeah, not as beautiful, but um, I guess growing up on a farm in Arizona, I, I definitely got a little tougher, but it was just so, so nice throughout the writing of uh, weaving in your experiences and then also through Smith songs as you were driving and, and, right. and um, well, thank soaking you. in. Yeah. I mean, I then... certainly worked hard. Your suicide <laughs> is like one of the hardest things I've ever worked on. Um, but I, I would just oh. say for anybody, cause I, I started as an improviser. My uh -huh. solo work was more storytelling at first. And then I kind of backdoored into the stand up scene. It was rocky and it was very, very rough. And I, to this day, I'm very jealous of the people who can just write punchline, punchline, punchline. Like, I think mm -hmm. the people who mm -hmm. can do that in a way that's smart and still shows off a lot of heart and like shows a little bit of themselves, I'm really mm -hmm. jealous of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but with the storytelling stuff, if there's anybody out there, I would say it's, it's really difficult because you bomb a lot. Like if you wind up on a bill, if you're out there trying to be a comedian <laughs> from a storytelling angle and you wind up on a bill where you're in a room where everybody is dropping punchlines, 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 even if you're cooking, it can be really hard. Like it takes a long time to be able to coexist in that space, just tell punch uh, stories. But mm -hmm. I remember having such a hard time wanting to quit a lot, but just feeling driven to not. Um, and I wound up seeing Mike Birbiglia do a workout run of my girlfriend's boyfriend. And I would say, if you're a storyteller who wants to figure out how to survive in the stand-up space, just go watch that. That's the best advice you can get because that was the one where I was like, oh, he's telling stories. But I, for some reason, was just able to see, oh, he hit a punchline there. There was a punchline hidden in plain sight there. He stopped on a dime to just like stop the story, hit that punchline, then take off running back into the narrative again. And uh, I mean, Mike's been a mentor to me. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, I mean, he's taken it so far. He's done storytelling comedy on Broadway. So it's like, he's clearly a master at it. But for some reason for me, my sister, my, my girlfriend's boyfriend was the one where I watched it and I went, oh, I can see him just like telling a story. The narrative mm -hmm. completes itself, but he's not worried so much about getting you the beginning, middle and the end as he is about just knocking down every punchline along the way in the story. Mm -hmm. That was the one that really unlocked to me how to survive as a stand-up. Uh, who does a storytelling style because it was it was tough to keep my head above water on on some of those bills I was on back in the day because there were a lot of good people in New York and it, it it's a it's really tough to teach them to stick with you um, in that yeah. environment it's really really hard really hard but Mike is the master at that oh man well I would say there are two masters because I <laughs> I mean I learned from, from him. <laughs> I learned from him. I'm happy. I'm happy to have gotten confident at it. And then, you know, like when I got past at the comedy cellar, that was a very big deal for me because I don't that talk about an environment where like everyone's good with a punchline and then I'm a storyteller guy. So I felt very proud that I, that felt like an accomplishment, but um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, Mike, Mike had done that first and, and he, uh, he definitely, he paved the way for me. So. Oh, man. Was there ever a point I know that the watching Verbiglio was a big pivotal point for you. But was there ever a point where you were thinking this isn't for me, I'm going to switch to just go punch, I'm going to be a punchline guy. See, I it was different for me because I had had, you know, I'm not a cocky person, but mm -hmm. I had had pretty great success in the improv scene before I ever tried um, stand up. Mm -hmm. It's funny because Verbigli actually pointed out to me, he was like, because when we did Don't Think Twice, you know, he wrote Don't Think Twice about about the improv scene and about like, what's it like to be on an improv mm -hmm. team with somebody who gets SNL? And I had been on an improv team with Bobby Moynihan when he got SNL. Bobby's one of my best friends. So Mike was picking nice. my brain a lot to try to like feel it out. So I, I, mm -hmm. I came from a place where I would go and do stand up and I'd try my stories and I'd be bombing. And for me, it wasn't, I should buckle down and try to do more punchlines. It was, mm -hmm. I should just kind of retreat back to the safety of improv. Um, like, why am I going to spend a night out doing shows, eating it this hard, when I could just go sign up, do a show at UCB, and not to be cocky, but at that point, probably go on that stage and phone it in a little bit and have everybody mm -hmm. really charmed. Mm -hmm. um, but that 
attitude has always kind of been the enemy to me. And I think there maybe is a little too much room in that for improv, right? You find out your shtick. People, I think, are maybe a little intoxicated by the, you get cut a lot of slack by the fact that they, right? This is why you can't just write down improv and have a good sketch because part of it is people yeah. understand the balancing act. Mm -hmm. So I was like, there's real temptation to just go, it'll be much easier to just not do this but it would right easier mm. was also translating to lazier and mike pointed out to me at one point he goes you know for all the people who came out of ucb he's like they're all actors and writers he's like i think you're the only person who's like really known just for being yourself like mm. and i was like oh that's interesting like, probably me and maybe jason manzukis are the two people who came out of ucb where it's like you know us for who being who we are not necessarily for like characters we've done on on shows um so i did know that i had something to offer as myself but it's a crazy it's actually a pretty crazy story that i think for anybody who wants to be a comedian could be pretty eye-opening which was so i was i was doing really good at ucb i started a storytelling show there and mm -hmm. there was a whole uh comedians in new york at the time will remember a place called rafifi it's a really, really big spot in the East Village. Um, probably a lot of comedy nerds might know that the CD of the show, Invite Them Up, which Eugene Merman did. And um, Invite Them Up was the big Wednesday night show at Rafifi, but Mulaney and Kroll ran a show there on a different night. Mm -hmm. Jenny Slate and Gabe Liedman had a show there. Joe Mandy and Noah Garfinkel. Um, wow. Yeah, like every show there was good. It was just a space where they had comedy shows every night and every night was good. So it was a huge hangout for alternative comedy. And mm -hmm. those people from that scene would come up to UCB all the time and do some shows. And they met me there and I was doing storytelling on storytelling nights and storytelling nights where the crowd knows, okay, it is going to take some time. We are going to get there. Mm -hmm. um, it does demand some attention. And I do really well at the storytelling. And they started saying, come down to Rafifi, do our stand-up shows. And I just bomb oh, no. hard. And it was really tough because I'd go, man, these work at, on a storytelling night. And then on a stand-up night, I just feel myself losing them. And I feel the crowd getting frustrated. Mm -hmm. And then, so my, my brother's a comedian too. My brother does comedy in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll try to keep the story short, but basically no, no. there's a comedy competition called Philly's Funniest. And I think a lot of cities have their versions of this. Uh -huh. And my brother was like, he calls me up and he's like, man, I'm going to do the Philly's funniest contest. And I was like, that doesn't really seem like you, man. And he's like, I'm going to like bomb on purpose. He's like, I'm going to go like kind of ruin it. I was like, why? Cause he's a trouble. <laughs> my brother's such a troublemaker, man. I'm like, why do you just let people do their thing? And he's like, well, look, he's like, the thing that bugs me is whoever wins the contest starts getting put up at these clubs. So everybody wants to do that. And I get it, but he's like, the, He's like, the shitty thing is like, everybody gets real competitive with like 11 months of a year, everybody's friends with each other. And then everybody just sort of gets like weird and tense around each other because everybody's trying to get a chance to go make money at a club that doesn't book any of us the rest of the year anyway. He's like, I just uh, think that's bad. I was mm -hmm. like, all right, man. So I went to see it. I was like, I'm going to come down and see it. And he came out and he like pretended to be LeBron James throwing the baby powder everywhere, but in a club with a low ceiling, it just got all the people were like so mad. It was on their clothes and in their drinks. And then <laughs> oh he built God. like a homemade t-shirt slingshot and was launching t-shirts into the crowd. But again, <laughs> from like three feet away from people's heads, like people thought this thing was going to like fall apart and like give them concussions and fly into the crowd. Oh, it was really God. funny. I mean, my bro, you know, the Andy Kaufman and um, it was really funny, but I watched the whole contest and I'm like this New Yorker. Yeah. And there's a cockiness to being a New Yorker, you know, mm -hmm. arrogance gets in the way of being a New Yorker sometimes, especially back then when I was younger and I'm watching mm -hmm. the Philly comics and I'm like, man, some of these Philly comics are really good, really good. And it's a contest. Some of them are seem like they're good, but they got real nervous. Some of them yeah. seem like they're bad and they're in over their head and I'm sitting there and I had this great humbling moment. And I, one thing I give myself credit for is, I really am aware that ego is not a good thing. Always have. Mm. Maybe sometimes I actually am aware of that to the point where I, I don't self-promote enough or put myself over enough, mm. but mm -hmm. I don't buy into, I don't buy into the ego side of things at all. And I'm sitting there and I'm, it was this huge light bulb went off for me. Cause I'm going, man, 
I'm like cream of the crop at UCB and mm -hmm. I'm getting invited onto shows at Rafifi and I haven't paid my dues. That's the end of the problem. Like me getting stressed out trying to do stand up, of course, because one of the first shows I ever did stand up on, I was invited to do it by John Mullaney and Nick Kroll. Now it's, it was 2009 or whatever. It wasn't 2021 oh. John Mullaney. I'm not saying that, but I uh -huh. am saying he, I, I should not have been on, I was skipping the line. I hadn't done open mics. I hadn't done all the bar shows where no one shows up. I hadn't dealt with hecklers in some room. You know, the things we all do where like you go and you mm -hmm. do a comedy show and you realize, oh no, the patrons of this bar didn't even know there was a comedy show. And they're kind of like vaguely mad that they have to stop having their evening of drinking with their friends. Those are all things you have to do to kind of learn how to exist in that environment, have a thick skin and have some versatility, um, you know, First time I ever did stand up, it was on a show Joe Mandy invited me to do. Joe's great. Pete Holmes, I think, was this one of the second second or third time I ever did. I'm on bills back then. And again, wow. not the 2021 version of these people, but still there's a reason they became what they came became, where I'm like, mm -hmm. I haven't even done stand-up a dozen times. And I'm on bills with Hannibal Burris and Reggie Watts, even 10, 15 years ago. It's a lot. It's a lot. Wow. So I realized oh, I have to pay my dues. Mm -hmm. So I actually started turning down some of the better shows. Like Whiplash was a big show in New York. I'd done it a couple of times. Jeremy from Whiplash was asking, I said, ah, you know, I, I don't think I'm quite there yet. Sweet Seth Herzog's show on Tuesday nights. I don't think I'm quite there yet. And I took a pretty good chunk of time and said, I'm going to do open mics. I'm going to do bar shows. I'm going to do shows that are really off the grid. Um, because I got to give myself that breathing room to be able to fail at the level of experience I'm at. Um, just because I'm good at improv does not mean I'm good at stand up. Like I'm comfortable enough on stage to get out of there without humiliating myself, but there's a panic here I don't like. Mm -hmm. So I kind of dove in. And then after, I would say like six months to a year, I started figuring out, okay, now I'm starting to find my voice a little bit. And then I started saying, okay, I'll do the good shows, but I'll tell them I want to go out pretty early on it and I'll still do all the bar shows. And I still love doing smaller shows. Mm -hmm. um, even though, you know, I'm older now and I have a kid and I don't have as much time. And I can't be out five, six nights a week doing shows. I right. still love them because there's so much to be learned there. But all of that was like about humbling myself and removing the ego from it. And just, but it's also this very funny thing where I, I, I'm in New York. I'm like, I span a bunch of different, different generations because like I started 21 years ago with people who are on, you know, have, you know, like I mentioned Bobby and Zach Woods yeah. from the office. These are some of my best friends from back in the day. And then, the Rafifi scene, like me and Joe Mandy still super tight. And I think feel like I was a part of that in a pretty big way. And then said, Oh, let me dip out of this. I, so then I started later with a whole other generation of comics that I think have like really started to take over now. And that you see a lot now, like mm -hmm. I remember doing a lot of bar shows with Dan Soder and Sam Morrill and, and oh, like yeah. a lot of other people. And then, and then I sort of, you know, helped, a lot of the Brooklyn alt scene when my public access show was going, I think a lot of the alt scene was kind of, it was kind of the glue of the alt scene for a while. And then a lot of those people, mm -hmm. and then went and got passed at the cellar. So I'm like, Oh, I've just kind of done, done a lot of what you can do in New York and feel good about that. I feel like I definitely earned my, earned my respect, even though not everybody respects me, the respect I have, I definitely <laughs> scrapped it and earned it. That is super cool and a really important lesson, I feel, too. Something that takes, uh, I think, a lot of courage, a lot of thought and reflection on, like, I haven't paid my dues. I'm going to go and, you know, earn my stripes like, yeah. I with my shirt. But, yeah, Indeed. I feel I, that that's really cool and, and um, a lot of respect to be able to pass on those opportunities, perhaps give them to others that were waiting in line. And then when you felt ready going and taking that opportunity and, and really seizing it. I think you have to do it. And I think one of the harsh things about 
comedy, especially stand up, mm -hmm. is one thing that I really, really, really don't like is when I see audiences, when I see comedians blame the audience. Like you tell a couple jokes, they don't hit. And then you see the audience, you see the comedians start to go like, ah, oh, you guys suck. Or like, oh, why did I even come out tonight? You guys are, you know, or people yeah. going, I don't care what you say. Yeah. I've seen that joke work. I, that joke works everywhere. That's on you guys. I you, I see people say stuff like this all the time. I It always drives me nuts. I never respect it because I go, no, no. Because I learned it so hard and fast in my earliest days where I go, mm -hmm it is never an audience's fault if a show goes wrong. Or I should say rarely. Every once in a while, you might have a perfect storm of dickheads. Mm -hmm. But whenever I see it, I go, oh, that's a spoiled comedian. That's a comedian who has someplace else they feel safer. But your job is not to... They pay money. So you, you work for them. They're the boss. They pay yeah. the money. They write the check. You get your 30 dot 20 30 40 dollars or your drink tickets or whatever or more if you've been doing it a while. Yeah. They're your boss. It's not their job to make you feel good. They didn't pay money so you could walk out of here feeling good about you. They paid money so they could forget about their problems for a while. They paid money so that they could laugh a little bit tonight. They paid money so they could come out on a date and the date could feel like they had this magical experience. And now they're going to go to another bar and talk about how funny it is. And they might make out at the end of that. that they paid their money. <laughs> You're providing them a service that they are paying for. It is 99.9% .9 of the time. It is not their fault. It is your fault. When you're doing stand-up comedy, you wrote the material. You put on the outfit that you wore on stage. Mm -hmm. You dictated everything about the delivery of that material you wrote it you're the lead actor and you're the director so if they don't like it they don't like you it's your fault they don't like you they don't like the things you tried to say or the way you tried to say them or both or they just don't have a good vibe of who you are it's your fault fix it that's one of your main jobs in your first i would say 10 years honestly as a comedian is mm -hmm. How do I translate the things I want to say via me as the vehicle that's saying them? How do I get a crowd to get on my side? How do I get a crowd to feel disarmed and comfortable? If they don't like it. It's not the crowd's fault. It's your fault. And that's fine. That's the hardest thing to reconcile, right? It's a really tough thing to feel and realize, oh, there's 50 people in a room deciding they don't like me. Well, don't verbalize that it's their fault. Understand it's your fault and understand there's a few things. A, some, 21 years in, sometimes I'll go up and bomb. I, I, I bombed so hard at the cellar one night after performing there for a few years that the bouncer was crying, laughing when I got off stage. I was like, you've seen me do all those jokes before, right? He's like, I've seen you crush with all those jokes before. I was like, they played to the fucking silence. He's like, silence. I, I cannot believe what I just witnessed. Silence. Like, oh, no. It happens. And that's a stage where I'm pretty comfortable at this point and where I feel yeah. like I, I earned the right to be there. It's going to happen. But yeah. even more so in your early days than those like freak nights it happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe you're punching above your weight. Go find a shittier open mic, if I'm being honest. Go find a bar show even further off the grid find a show where you make a little more sense mm. master it make it unquestionable that you're going to come in there and obliterate that type of show now head back to the show where there's a little more pressure now find the hipper room now find that booked show that you really have been clamoring to get on because it's a hot room master the small parts master the annoying parts the shittier parts master all those environments and anytime it's failing i'm not talking bad about la i've never lived in la so sometimes people think i'm an la hater i like la a lot if i had wound up there i would have been pretty thrilled it's warm it's <laughs> nice most of my friends live there now it's just i managed to do pretty well in the northeast so i stuck with it i'll tell you one night i was out there and i go I go to the show and it was at some weird spot 
and people had told me, oh, this show is in this weird location, man. It's gonna, you're going to like it, man. It's going to fit how weird you like to get. And I went, it was a cool show, but every comedian before me blamed the audience. The audience was tight. And every comedian, three or four jokes in, man, you guys suck, this and that. Uh, Why did I even pay for the valet? Well, so I was watching it. I was getting really stressed on behalf of the audience. I'm going, man, these comedians are giving up on this crowd really quick. And I went up there. And I remember I just go, hey, I want to thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. I know there's a bunch of other stuff you probably could have been doing. Thanks for giving me some of your time. I just did my set. And they weren't great in the beginning. I never mentioned it. And then after my set, a bunch of the L.A. comedians were like, holy shit, dude, you really wrecked it. Like, this room's been dead all night. And I'm sitting here in my head. I'm not trying to talk bad to people. But I'm going, yeah, I didn't tell them they were idiots for showing up. (laughs) And I will say that is one thing that New York comics know implicitly is Mm -hmm. like, a lot of cities in this world, if you go out to a stand-up show, that's what you did for the night. And that's it. You got in a car, you drove there, you had to find parking. You're going to do that. And then you're going to go home. And that's what it is. And you're held captive. But in New York, an audience is never held captive ever because it's not an exaggeration to say that if a show is shitty in New York, an audience member could stand up, leave, not even turn on their phone to Google and if they walk left, they're going to find something cool. If they walk right, they're going to find something cool. There's going to be a band playing. There's going to yeah. be some street performer going. There's going to be some speakeasy that they stumble into. There's going to be something. Like it's mm-hmm. a city built around 24-hour subways and the neighborhoods where stuff happens, there's dozens of things happening. Like you walk out any neighborhood that would be putting on a show, there's going to be something else happening. So you cannot, you cannot as a New York comic make your audience think like they're foolish for being there. Cause then they're going to go, okay, I'll go somewhere else and I'll walk and it'll take me five minutes to get there. And I don't have to go find parking again. And I don't have to wait for the, I don't have to wait for the valet to get my car out in winter. I can just throw my hat, my jacket on and walk across the street and be eating at a Michelin star restaurant right now. You dickhead be better at what you do. So that's part of why I like New York so much anyway. So anyway, I'm ranting and raving. I'll shut up. No, no, this is great. I'm going to take my shirt and just bundle up all these Gethard gems that I've acquired <laughs> from this time. This is fantastic. Um, we're going to wind down. That are, this is a comedy advice podcast. You've given a bountiful um, amount of comedy advice. We're going to give a little bit of, of advice from questions from the Reddit advice column or thread. Oh, and, and wait, this is not stuff specifically. It's not like people said, could you ask Gethard something? It's just general advice. This is just general advice. Okay. And I, I felt like, well, I, disclaimer, we're not professionals, although you're a comedy professional, but I feel like we could give some solid advice to these questions. We'll okay. See. Okay. This first one, we've only got two, but this first one is I can't stop buying plants. And why should I even stop issues with guilt over the last year and a half? I bought 30 plants, maybe spent around 200 pounds on the hobby. And I can afford that. I grew up with very frugal parents and find splashing out hard, even if I can. Our small house is not cluttered by them, but I do admit every windowsill and shelf is now full and still. I don't really have an addictive personality to other things. Once purchased, I feel an overwhelming sense of guilt, like I've wasted money. What can I do and why do I feel so guilty? I mean... I right away sit here and go, I mean, the real question is, why do you feel so guilty? Because if you say you have this level of disposable income, it's not truly cluttering up your house Then with a lot of plants. And if it gives you joy, it feels pretty lovely to me. It sounds lovely uh, as long as it's something that you can maintain and that the plants aren't going to like, you know, there's not so many that you're neglecting them and they're all like dying and not getting watered. So I feel like the real question here is, is much less about the plants and much more about why do you feel guilty? And you said you had frugal parents and it, you know, I think all of us, our parents hand us some stuff that uh, you got to unwrap. And it seems to me like these plants are probably, it's not about the plants. It's about, they're representing an opportunity for you to unwrap some of the way you were raised. It sounds like, and that's a much tougher question, but just enjoy the plants in the meantime. Cause it, yeah. it, I have to say 200 pounds, I don't think I, you know, the translation, I think the pound's more valuable than the dollar, but that's not that ludicrous an amount of money to spend on something that gives you joy and that 
ostensibly joy, a lifetime of joy that these plants keep living for years. So I think you got to cut yourself some slack, go easy on yourself and make it a little bit more about why am I filled with panic when I spend money? Uh, Cause some of that sounds like maybe some of the stuff your parents did. So that's either going to come around to figuring out the elements to which your parents were crazy or maybe having some realizations as an adult that your parents sacrificed a lot for you and that there wasn't mm-hmm. that disposable income on their end. And there's, that's where some of the guilt comes from, but none of that's on you. Enjoy your plants. I say. That, I agree. I mean, I would love to come over to your house. It sounds like an amazing place. And I, I think you pretty much nailed it, Chris. I feel maybe the parents did plant something inside of this person to feel guilty well about. Said. And so well <laughs> said, and they watered it and they fertilized it. And now it, <laughs> Maybe it was a weed that needs to be pulled, it turns out. That might be. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I feel like we gave that question water and love and attention. So we're going to move on to the next one. Advice on getting over this fear. Yesterday, I had an allergic reaction to crab and had to be hospitalized for about a few hours. I went out to eat today over vacation and attempted to eat chicken, but my anxiety and fear of being allergic once more has made me unable to eat anywhere new. I need advice on how to get rid of this thought process. Thanks. Mm. I mean, this one is definitely something I am not qualified to speak to. <laughs> Are you allergic to anything, Chris? Um, no, I, I, I will tell you, I one time woke up covered in hives all over my body to the point where I was living at with my folks at the time. My mom, my mom was like, you have to go to the hospital. This is crazy. And they gave me antihistamines that solved it. And I, they were like, you're allergic to something. And it's never happened again. And I don't know what I'm allergic <laughs> to. Um, oh, God. But yeah, I'm not thus far. My kid isn't knock on wood that that remains the case. It's very hard, very scary, but I do feel like rest. I mean, I I guess the one thing I can say is you can take strength in the knowledge that um, we live in such a litigious society and restaurants, I think, are so on the hook for being um, responsible for what is what they're cooking with and letting you know Mm -hmm. that at the very least know that there's a, a world of fearful restaurant owners who do not want to get sued by including shellfish and something and not letting you know. So that at the very least, the the harsh litigiousness of society should probably help you trust the word of the restaurant staffs you're dealing with generally. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you know what? If you want to know everything you're allergic to as well there's tests out there right don't they just prick you with little needles and i think uh, so with different different like small extracts of crab or chicken or lavender Eggs, and then they're yeah. like here's your results so you and get carry to find an out EpiPen. let's also just make sure carry an epi pen let's be responsible that way too i agree i definitely agree all right well beautiful i feel like we answered all those questions i feel more elevated and uh, transcended, perhaps. And Chris, this was an awesome time. Thank you so much for oh, joining. Thank you. Um, I hope I didn't ramble too much. I would also say one thing about anybody looking for advice on anything is, yeah, if you, I always have said, like, if you hear advice and it seems like you have a really negative reaction to it, just completely ignore it and understand that if you follow those instincts that are hating that advice, that might lead you to get to where you need to go anyway so also if i said anything that sounds boneheaded or totally off to you like that's fine and uh i hope that you're i hope that whatever you're reacting against gives you something too i love perhaps you're allergic to that advice so Mm, stay away mm -hmm. from it Get, mm-hmm. always carry an EpiPen. That's, mm-hmm. that's what's important here. Chris, well, I was going to ask too, where can people follow you? What have you got going on? What would you like to plug? Oh, well, you know, I got the new special out. You can find me on Instagram at Chris Geth and Twitter at Chris Gethard and uh, Chris Geth.com is my website. And I'm, I'm touring uh, 20 cities by the end of 2021. I got another bunch already lined up for 2022. So all the ticket links and dates are are up on the website and I'll be going all over, all over the States. So I might be coming to a town near you. Maybe you buy a ticket, come check it out. Amazing. And links are going to be in the show notes. So guys, you can just get your little thumb, click on that. If you're on your phone, if you're on your computer, don't use your thumb, use your mouse, but uh, click responsibly. And you're going to be in Phoenix. I saw in, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, when was it? November? I think November 20th. That, I, that that sounds right, and I think it's a pretty. From what I hear, it's a pretty cool spot. 
Um, yeah. Yes. I've, stand stand up live. It's uh, a great spot. It, oh, I love it. Yeah. Oh, I think it's like 300 CB people, live, so CB live. Oh, I'm sorry. CB live. Yes. CB live. Also great spot. I think it's the same owners, but yeah, that's a great spot. And, uh, they've got, they've actually got live music in one room and then, um, the showroom with stand up. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited for it. Um, I know I've, I've done Arizona once before I did the Tempe improv, which was a actually a very good club, but I've been, I've been kind of straying away from the clubs and going more towards these like music spaces and event spaces. And I really want to, I really want to rock this one out. So maybe people come hang out. Oh, that's going to be, yeah, that'll be lots of fun. And my friends, that is the end of the podcast. Chris Gethard, everybody clap, clap, clappity clap, clap for him wherever you are subscribe leave a review follow me on instagram and follow chris watch his special give him some love and oh i forgot to mention i'm going to be performing stand up august 1st at the bridge improv theater in tempe link will be in the show notes there and i will be hosting in gilbert arizona jp's comedy club the 26th through the 28th link will be in the show notes there so click it clicky clicky on those to get those tickies okay yeah. All right. All right, guys, you guys have been a blessing in my life. Namaste in my life, please. Bless you all. Blessings rain down upon you. That's the noise blessings make. So guys, stay soaked in all those blessings and stick around for another episode. I'm Stefan Satani, signing off. <laughs>